Good evening. I'm Jeff Badnock, and on behalf of the University of Montana Alumni Association and the Community Lecture Series Committee, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Community Lecture Series. This series, now in its 25th year, showcases some of the outstanding faculty here at the university and they work they do, the work they do in advancing research and learning. We will begin with the university's statement of acknowledgement. The University of Montana acknowledges that we are on the aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today we honor the path they have always shown us and carry for this place for the generations to come. These lectures are being video recorded by our friends at MCAT, Missoula Community Media Resource, for later cablecast and posting to YouTube. And I heard from uh, MCAT today that the lectures are now being cablecast. So the first uh, lectures will be shown twice this week, uh, and it's on channel 188. Nine. 189. Uh, so later, during our Q&A, we will be handing around microphones to capture your questions and comments from the audience uh, for those who are watching over the internet and for the later cable cast. Please, at this time, take a moment now to silence your personal devices. Tonight is our penultimate lecture in the series, and we'd like you here and at home to begin thinking about the series and what you enjoyed about it and any suggestions you have for improving it or for lecture series topics next year. We'll have more about that next week on how to submit comments to us, but begin thinking about it now. The seal of the University of Montana features a hand holding high a torch and bears the university's motto, Luke's at Veritas, Light and Truth. Our university is a place where students come to study, learn, and conduct research in an effort to pursue, pursue light and truth for themselves and for others. The university's efforts at supercharging this effort was recognized this past year when it was awarded R1 designation as one of the nation's top research institutions. It would be daunting to provide you with a lecture series that touched on all the areas in which the University of Montana faculty are doing research that earned that award but we are happy to present a series where you can gain some appreciation of the world-class research going on across the campus. For the fourth lecture in the series, the committee has selected Sean Hill, assistant professor in the Department of English, born and raised in Mill Edgeville, Georgia? Yes. Yeah. Sean Hill is the author of two poetry collections, Dangerous Goods, and that's in the Milkweeds edition 2014, and awarded the, Missoula, or the Minnesota Book Award in Poetry, and Blood Ties and Brown Liquor from the UGA Press in 2008, which was named one of the 10 books all Georgians should read in 2015 by the Georgia Center for the Book and numerous other awards. Sean's poems and essays have appeared in Callaloo, Harvard Review, The Oxford American, Poetry, Terrain.org, Tin House, and new, numerous other journals, and in two dozen anthologies. He has taught at several universities, including the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Georgia Southern University. Please join me in welcoming Sean Hill as he presents his lecture, The World is Yours, Research and Creative Writers. Sean? Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all for coming. It's a great honor to be a part of this series. Um, I've got to know some of the other presenters, and it was <sighs> Monica's lecture and, and, and um, Mike's lecture, um, Dr. Uh, Serban and Dr. Menick's lectures um, were, were quite impressive. And I was like, I'm just going to read some poems. We'll see how this goes. Um, I love the, the theme this year, research, inquiry, and um, ways of knowing. Um, poetry, all art, is about sort of exploring and expressing the human condition. Um, and thinking back to the lectures that have happened already, um, 
They discussed ways of knowing to create tools with concrete medical applications, tools that will impact people's lives and their conditions as humans. Um, poems are impactful. Um, they are capable of doing a similar kind of work. They change us. Um, people often say they save our lives. I'm going to talk about uh, ways that uh, I and other poets use research in our poems uh, in pursuit um, of this life-changing work, um, this sort of culture-changing work. Um, first, I'll talk about um, historical research in the ways uh, I and others, but mostly myself, uh, use that in poetry um, in order to uh, engage and explore our subjects and our curiosity. Um, a little bit about me my, in my research. I have to sort of go back a little bit to sort of explain how I got here. Um, I was born and raised in Milledgeville, Georgia, and um, was not particularly interested in history. Um, I, I wanted to, to be a, a fantasy writer when I, when I was a kid, um, but I worked, in the, um, worked on the school newspaper. And in my senior year, I was, I was assigned uh, to write um, a, an article about the 20th anniversary of desegregation in Milledgeville, the school desegregation in Milledgeville. Um, my senior year was the 1990-91 school year. Um, and that's when it dawned on me how close that history was to my life. I was born in 1973, um, a couple of years after desegregation, um, and that connection to the history wasn't made, hadn't been made clear to me. Um, and maybe I wasn't paying attention, but um, I didn't know that that, that was so close. Um, you know, in school, I learned about uh, the 19 or 1895 Plessy versus Ferguson decision. I learned about um, the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision and 1955 Brown II decision with all deliberate speed. I learned about the civil rights movement, um, but somehow the distance, uh, the closeness rather, um, wasn't communicated to me. So writing this article in which I interviewed um, teachers about what desegregation was like kind of began to make me understand sort of how, how um, history is with us. Um, I ended up writing a book, uh, Blood Ties and Brown Liquor, in which I explored the history of my hometown through the lens of um, the black community and uh, one black character I invented in particular, Silas Wright. Um, I did a bit of research for that book. Um, I interviewed people in my community. I went to the library, to the archives, and read old newspapers. Um, I wandered around town and looked at old buildings and tried to get a sense of what life was like before me. Um, and in that, I, 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 I found that the life that those people li lived um, was, was very much uh, like my life in some ways. Um, so working with trying to, this material I was gathering and hone my craft uh, as a poet, um, I sort of started writing these poems about the place. Um, one of the poems I'm gonna read to you is, is Auspice, it, com it comes out of uh, looking uh, through the newspapers um, from the, the 19 teens, uh, just trying to find out what was newsworthy. Um, and what was newsworthy uh, was, was the fact that a plane flew to Milledgeville for the first time. Um, it was a military plane. Um, and so just trying to imagine that event um, sort of engendered this poem, Auspice. Um, so I'll, I'll read the poem. Auspice. It has an epigraph, um, Woodrow Wilson quote. Um, the world must be made safe for democracy. This late May morning, spring spills into summer, warm as a bath in a tin tub where ivory soap floats for those who can afford it. 
white as clouds or cotton, graying water the same as lye soap, homemade brownish yellow speckled with white flecks, fat boiled together with ashes collected after smoke has gone up to the wide sky. The wind crawls through treetops, oaks, elms, and pines. Leaves sift sound as limbs groan and creak. Crepe myrtle blossoms blush dust devils. They glide across swept yards and dirt roads. Mockingbirds find the highest perches and sing, while quiet turkey buzzards ride the rising heat above all. A drone like wasps on the breeze, or hens beating themselves down from low branches, roosts they yearned for yesterday. For the first time under heaven, men fly over Milledgeville, flying at angles to navigate. They will soon go to war. In boats bound for France, colored soldiers cross the slate ocean. So that poem, for me, like it started with the airplane, but the airplane was a military airplane. So my digging around um, made me understand sort of a larger context of the time that I wanted to sort of explore with the poem. Um, but also wanted to explore place and capture place. Um, and, and I like birds. So. so reading old newspapers, reading history books, um, I read a, there's a book about my hometown um, by the, the historian James Bonner, Milledgeville, um, Georgia's antebellum capital. It was that. Um, it was also the Confederate capital. Um, in reading uh, this history, I, I um, came across mention of two black men uh, who snagged my imagination. And that's sort of what the research does, like this broadening of one's knowledge base. Um, you, the more you know, the more you want to know, the more you can work with. Um, so these guys snagged my imagination. Uh, they were um, Sandy Ganaway, um, who's from Milledgeville, and uh, a guy named Alan Yancey, um, who was from the next town over, Sparta, Georgia. Um, when I read his name, I was like, there's gonna be a poem eventually about this guy, Sandy Ganaway, who, um, who actually left. So their story in the history was that they and 150 or so other people from the area left during Reconstruction to go to Liberia. Um, they returned to Milledgeville, um, or he returned to Milledgeville um, shortly after leaving. They left in 1872 and he came back in early um, 1874. And so I was curious about him, um, Sandy, uh, but I, I didn't have enough information, I didn't have access to the right archives to, to know what I needed to know about him. Um, and so he didn't make it into this book. Um, I carried them around, Sandy and Alan, for a number of years. I, I had this sort of kernel of a story. I had some newspaper articles. Um, they both wrote letters to the local paper. Um, Alan explained that he had uh, suffered some tragedy in Liberia. He lost family members, children, a wife um, to the fever, but he wasn't going to come back to Milledgeville. Um, and Sandy Ganaway, just, he left his family there. He was like, I, I can't stay in, in Liberia. Um, so I, I had to find the place that would give me the information, that, was, that I could find the information that I needed, the research I needed to do um, to get uh, the poems, to get to the poems. I applied for and got a, a fellowship at the American Antiquarian Society um, in 2010. And I went there, wonderful research facility, and read a lot for a month about Liberia. Um, at the time, I was living in northern Minnesota um, and writing a book of poems that involved a lot of the north northern Minnesota. But the Liberia 
um, material ended up in this book because the book is about migration and that research resonated with my migrating to the north from the south and their migrating um, or emigrating to Liberia. Um, and going there um, to the American Antiquarian Society, I found out that um, you know, they have the newsletters for the American Colonization Societies. There's so many societies. Um, and the newsletters talked about the different expeditions to um, Liberia, and particularly I, I got to read about these people leaving, Mil leaving Milledgeville in central Georgia to go to Liberia. And I learned a little bit more about them and sort of thinking about their lives. Um, that's one of the things the research does. It gives you a glimpse into people's lives and sort of helps you to understand uh, their psychology, their emotional states, and gives you sort of, uh, fosters empathy for folk. Um, and I just thought, well, you know, why did Sandy come back? Um, and I found out that he was in his 70s when he went to Liberia. Um, and that maybe when you're 70, you making such a big move is not viable, is my conclusion. Um, he never outright says in the letter to the paper why he wanted to come back, except that it just wasn't working out for him. Um, so I'll read you uh, the next poem, is Ganaway Returns. Um, Ganaway Returns. 1874. Broke in New York and trying to get home, old Sandy Ganaway, older than Milledgeville by a couple of years, wants to get back to where he'd been freed after being owned, before being born, home, Georgia. He's seen Africa and Liberia in nearly every way did not agree with the old man. Recognized faces, but didn't know the natives like folks back home, and never took a liking to the food or the way the light shone. Liberia created for those folks, freed after being owned before being born, and old Sandy Ganaway never embraced as mother and long lost son returned home. It couldn't hold him the way the land of his father's owners and owned held on. Where old Sandy Ganaway can conceive of dying as each and every man must is the land he knows like his wife's arms. Where does home come from? The same place as race? Man is always inventing things, such as nations like Liberia and America, where Sandy was freed before being owned, so after being owned, before being born. Um, so some of, the th some of what I got um, going to the American Antiquarian Society and researching, reading um, old newspapers and whatever I can get my hands on um, was just a window into the everyday world of the era. Um, the things that uh, were found to be newsworthy, um, what was on sale at the local dry goods store, whatever, you know, those kinds of things. Um, primary documents. Um, also give language, and they give textual details. Um, part of what I do is attempt to imagine the physical reality of places in the past. Um, those details help me understand and imagine the people's experience. Um, for example, when I moved uh, to northern Minnesota, I noticed the atmospheric differences between uh, uh, 10 or 15 degrees in latitude make. Um, not just in temperature, but also in the quality and the amount of light. Um, the light is very different in northern Minnesota than it is in Georgia, and the light in Alaska is very different from northern Minnesota. Um, 
but I didn't think about uh, the simple and obvious fact of light in Liberia until one day I was at the American Antiquarian Society reading and I came across a passage um, about the equatorial sunlight and twilight in Liberia. Um, there's, there's a book written by a guy named Thomas um, McCant Stewart. Uh, the book is uh, Liberia, the America African Republic, which also is enlightening to think about the way that people talked about themselves, um, the people who left, who chose to go to Liberia, um, identified as Americo Africans. Um, so the Americo African Republic, he says, lies wholly within the tropics and is very near the equator. Its southern extremity is only four degrees north of that great belt, and its northern limit, seven degrees. The days and nights are practically equal. There is no twilight. Darkness follows fast behind the setting sun, and the daylight breaks again suddenly upon the darkness. Stewart, and he's an African-American lawyer who immigrated in, uh, from South Carolina to Liberia in 1883, um, where he taught at the at Library College um, for a couple of years. His observation sort of helped me think about some of Sandy's and Allen's reality. Um, there's a line in the poem about the way the light shone. Um, I, I, I've experienced the different ways light shines, and yeah, it can it can be maddening sometimes. Um, this kind of research, this kind of writing, um, encourages exploration into specific locales and local histories through language, um, through narrative, through lyric poems. I think uh, it can increase one's stake in one's community. Um, it also encourages specific and detail-oriented writing. Um, I think most importantly for me, it becomes an exercise, as I said, in empathy, imagining the daily life through the five senses, through objects, through activities, through events, and exercising in understanding someone's perspective, another person's perspective. Um, there's a lot of us poets who are writing sort of historical poems, uh, writing in a docu-poetic vein. Um, I, I've included uh, a poem in the packet, we'll get to a little later. Um, so this work, this research that we do, like, well, what kind of research do you do? Um, it's research uh, that uh, the writer um, Philip Gerard talks about in um, his essay, and his, his, he has a book also with the same title, The Art of Creative Research. Um, and he sort of describes three different types of creative research. Um, he, gave, he put a name to sort of what I'd been doing already. Um, he talks about deliberate research uh, directed at a particular project. That would be me going to the American Antiquarian Society. I'm going to an archive with a question in mind. He also talks about deliberate research uh, not directed toward a particular project, um, sort of going to a museum or an archive or experimental forest, which I'll talk about later, with an openness, um, ready to capture anything that, that pulses, that feels electric, that vibrates, that feels hot in some way. Um, and then there's accidental research, which is just living attentively, recognizing when you've encountered something that pulses, that feels electric, that vibrates and is hot in some way. Um, so, one of my one of my dear friends, who is a um, fiction writer, used to have a T-shirt that said, "Researching my novel." There's just something you wear every day because you're kind of always, always researching your novel, right? As a poet, I'm always looking, listening. Um, he goes on to talk about archives, and he describes an archive as any repository of knowledge. Um, by gathering material, uh, we are creating our own repositories. Um, in a passage about archives, he says, there are seven kinds, though any writer may reasonably count more or less, or, and of course, many of the particular sources spill over into one or more category. Um, the number is not important, um, just the attitude that archives are found 
in many more places than the library, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later too. Um, he goes on to say, uh, you need to be inventive and imagine where the knowledge you want will be found. Um, part of researching is finding out what you have to find out. Uh, by the time you finish the research phase of your project, um, you will become the expert on it um, and you will in fact create the archive specific for your purpose. He sort of lists these archives as paper archives, living archives, electronic archives, visual archives, audio archives, experiential archives, and my favorite, archives of memory and imagination. Um, so that's sort of what I do with history. Um, other poets are using science, in, in engaging with science and scientific facts. Um, the poet Christina Olson um, has a book just out from uh, University of Pittsburgh Press titled um, The Anxiety Workbook. Um, in that book, she has these mastodon poems because she ended up falling in with some scientists uh, at her university um, who studied mastodons. And they took her to a mastodon conference as a poet and she just started writing about mastodons. Um, she also then realized that she really liked using science in her work, um, engaging with science. And so she's kind of continued this work. Um, she says there are five ways science, scientific fact functions in poetry um, for her. Um, what she can tell is scientific fact lends surprising and unexpected diction and syntax to a poem. He says scientific fact um, provides perspective on a geological time scale. Scientific fact can provide a lens by which the poem can view something else. Scientific fact can provide a place to pivot off a topic in a poem. And then scientific fact is cool. <laughs> and your poem gets to talk about how cool it is. I'll read her poem, uh, Lesson from the West African Lungfish. In a year of panic, envy any creature who estivates in the heat. Line a cavity with mucus and hunker down. A bunker hardens around you. Watch the river shrivel without worry. In the 1950s, humans dug up backyards, poured concrete, stocked canned goods. The lungfish feeds not off spam, but from its own muscle, digests itself into slime and vitamin. When the rivers flood again, Emerge from your opposite hibernation. Your legs don't walk, but they taste. Masticate, mash, gulp, slurp. Scientists say you are in a constant state of agitation, but they are just jealous. They too want to touch everything again to pull themselves from the muck and mire. They watch you gulp a goldfish, exhale orange flakes, swim between stars in that little galaxy, the one you built wholly from yourself. Um, this poem was published in Scientific American. Um, which I think is really cool, in you know, July of 2021. Um, I think this poem does that thing. She was saying um, the scientific fact can provide a lens by which the poem can view something else. And I think in this case, the poem is viewing our state in the pandemic, right? Sort of how we had to be 
holed up and away from others in the, that year of panic, right? Um, and it can, it's about other things too. Um, there's another poem that, that uh, uses scientific fact um, and uses it as sort of a pivot, right? Um, this poem, Trophic Cascade, by um, Camille Dungy from her book, Trophic Cascade. Um, this is, I, I love this poem too. So Trophic Cascade is when you introduce something to, I mean, it's in the poem, but I'll tell you, if you don't know, um, something, in, uh, an organism into an environment and its introduction um, shifts everything. There's this cascading um, shift that happens. So Trophic Cascade. After the reintroduction of gray wolves to Yellowstone and as anticipated, their culling of deer Trees grew beyond the deer stunt of the mid-century. In their up, in their reach, in their upreach, songbirds nested, who scattered seed from underbrush for underbrush. And in that cover, worn snowshoe hair, weasel and water shrew returned, also bull. And soon, and, came, and so came soon hawk and falcon, bald eagle, kestrel, and with them hawk shadow, falcon shadow. Eagle shade and kestrel shade haunted newly buried runnels where deer no longer rummaged, cautious as they were now of being surprised by wolves. Berries brought bear while undergrowth and willows growing now right down to the river brought beavers who dam. Muskrats came to the dams and tadpoles, came to the night song of the fathers of tadpoles. With water striders, the dark gray American dipper bobbed in fresh pools of the river and fish stayed, and the bear who fished also culled deer fawns, and to their kills, kill scraps came vulture and coyote, long gone in the region until now, and their scat scattered seed, and more trees, brush, and berries grew along the river that had run straight and so flooded but thus damned, compelled to meander, is less prone to overrun. Don't you tell me this is not the same as my story. All this life born from one hungry animal, this whole new landscape, the course of the river changed. I know this. I reintroduced myself to myself, this time a mother, after which nothing was ever the same. So there's that turn, that pivot that she's talking about, um, that she says scientific fact can provide. Um, and she, that don't, don't you tell me, this is not the same as my story. It's so really, um, fantastic poem that sort of describes in lovely language like trophic cascade but then also gives us a way to think about the human condition. Um, so that's what I do, that's what other poets do. There's a lot of us writing science, a lot of us writing history, um, writing sort of docu-poetic stuff, um, interested in, in sort of so many different spaces. Um, that's what we do. And then a lot of us are also teaching and taking students to different places and showing them really neat and wonderful things, doing research, the research I sort of described before. Um, here at UM, I occasionally 
get to teach this class, research for creative writers, and we go on observation and inspiration outings. And we go to places um, like Fort Missoula or um, Lubrick Experimental Forest, um, where this fall I went with the class and Dr. Scott Fernberg gave us this fantastic tour. We had a great conversation um, into the twilight. Um, we've spent time in the special collections and archives at the Mansfield Library and Professor Donna McRae um, is lovely in sort of opening things up and showing us what's there. Um, one of my favorite places to go, and I've gone a few times, I really like it, is the Philip L. Wright Zoological Museum um, and Dr. Angela Hansberry, or Hornsberry, Horn, uh, Angela Hornsby um, just sort of welcomes us in. We have these really great conversations about what that work is and what the value of those kinds of um, collections are to science and the sort of ongoing work of collecting things, um, specimens. Um, so that's what, what I do um, with the students and they write really fascinating things that come out of these sort of this research. And occasionally I do too. Um, when we went to Lubrick Forest, um, we we were wandering around. We weren't wandering exactly. We were on you know we were going along. Um, he was giving us the, this tour, and there was uh, a stand of ponderosas, and um, Dr. Fernberg sort of was like there's these ponderosas, and I was like yes ponderosas. I'm aware of this tree in the world. I've I've I, I have encountered it. I know that they have these wonderful smells and I encourage the students to go stick their nose in the experiential part. Like we're writing things down, but also go stick your nose up against this tree and smell it. And, um, and ask them what they smelled. And one of them said, after they you know, all had the experience of smelling it, I didn't want them to contaminate each other's um, experience. One of them said it smelled like yogurt and grape, or yogurt and granola. And I was like, that doesn't sound right to me. I, 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 re I remember these trees as smelling like either butterscotch or vanilla. And so then we had a really wonderful conversation about why the trees smelled differently in different places and different populations of trees. And then he explained that this particular population of trees, because of the DNA research they're able to do with trees, um, came, migrated from what's now Mexico. And I was like, oh, that's going in a poem. I have to write this down somewhere. I don't know where it's going to go in a poem, but I feel like this is going to go in a poem. Um, so um, this next poem mentions that. Um, and so that was me going to do some research with no particular project in mind. Um, I went to the, the book festival, the Missoula Book Festival this fall too. Um, and I went to a, a, a talk um, about a new book about Rose Gordon um, of White Sulphur Springs. Um, and as part of that talk, there was another author who had written a book about her parents, or her grandparents, who'd immigrated from Eastern Europe to East Helena. And um, in the Q&A, one of the questions was, well, why did these people come to Montana? Particularly um, Rose Gordon, who's parents immigrated in the 1880s, I think it was, and she was born in White Sulphur Spring. Um, I shouldn't say immigrated, they migrated um, to, to White Sulphur Springs. And um, that question struck me. I was like, well, why not Montana? <laughs> um, so I was, I was invited to write a poem for an anthology about a migratory bird, and so I chose the Western Tanager, and then all of these things kind of came together, these little bits of research, the, the intentional putting myself in a place, but without any intent, no question, just open to hearing what might be said and finding out the trees migrated from Mexico. Um, and then going to the book festival and just having my ears open and hearing this thing, this question, um, so I wrote this poem, The Western Tanager, um, or Why Montana. Are wanderings the same as migrations? I came to Montana for love. 
which sometimes is how we know our destinations. The western tanager flies here for procreation when the snow goes wet, puddles, runs, and takes to far wandering. Is this the same as migration? A life is the sum of grand and modest peregrinations. Communities bloom at the meeting of opportunity and ambition and can be a way to know our destinations. A fire engine red head cooling to orange to sunny yellow body with those charcoal wings, the male western tanager flashes conflagration or an eastern autumn in flight. One familiar greeted me shortly after we both arrived, looking, letting me know our wanderings weren't the same, his a migration. In a stand of Ponderosa, where a snow blanket lay for decades or longer, the dendrologist says, the trees moved up from what's Mexico as that quiet water pulled back. A different migration, moving seed by seed north generationally, migrating to where they had been and where they could live, never asking, how do we know our destination? Why Montana? One among my interrogations, both public and private, like how big is a home? Are wanderings the same as migrations? And how do I know my destinations? Um, there's some other poems in the packet um, that I think will help enlighten um, you on sort of what people are up to and sort of illustrate what they're doing um, in the poem. There's one of Christina's Mastodon poems here, Catalog of Damages. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because it mentions Lewis and Clark. So she's sort of gathering stuff from various places um, in this poem. She's talking about the facts, the scientific facts she learned about mastodons, but also she'd been reading about Thomas Jefferson and Lewis and Clark, and that apparently Thomas Jefferson, because people didn't know what was out here, that's why he was sending people out here, he thought that the mastodons were still roaming around out here. And so that was one of the things they were supposed to be looking for was mastodons. Um, yeah. And Here's a reward poster and the typescript, but also a poem um, titled Reward by Kevin Young, um, who will be actually a visiting writer here next month, um, to sort of get you a sense of, like, historical research gives us sort of forms sometimes to, like, to use the form of the reward poster and some of the language um, in that. Uh, the mannerisms of, of constructing this kind of document to write a poem um, can be generative and useful. Right. And there are lists of, of and a, a very small, like not comprehensive at all, list of, of poems that, uh, or books of poems uh, that use research. Um, and I haven't really talked about the research that novelists do or creative nonfiction writers do. I'm a poet, mostly gonna talk about poetry. But like, yeah, there are, there are books out there if you're interested in um, this kind of work. Um, you can find all kinds of neat projects. Um, I guess I have about 15 minutes. Yeah, any questions? Yes. Oh, we have to give you the microphone. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
So I'm curious, um, how do you know when a historical event uh, lends itself to uh, telling about by through poetry as opposed to prose or you know some other some other form? Does it just kind of come to you? This would make a good poem, or is there some characteristic of the history that you know speaks to you as a poet? Um, I'm primarily a poet. I do write um, some nonfiction, um, not really much fiction at all. Um, and I, uh, a, a poem, you know, for, for me, like when I'm when I'm scratching around this historical stuff, I have questions. You know, I, I have things I'm interested in, and um, like some of the things she's talking about, that, 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 that list of what scientific fact can do. Historical facts can do those things too. Um, I'm interested, and I think we're all interested in the facts and rendering the facts as best we can. Um, and you know, sometimes facts change, um, but th there are. It's, it's the drafting process. There are things that I'm like, oh, I want to write about that. I will try to write about them. And if it doesn't come, then I have to move to the next thing. There are so many, I know so much about Liberia at this point, mm -hmm. but I have like, you know, a, a small number of poems about Liberia. I could talk to you for at least an hour about the establishment of Liberia. Who was there, what the decisions were, how it happened. Like, I, I've, I read the, the first constitution of Liberia. I could talk to you a little bit about that. That's not in the poems. So there's something, for me, it's those human moments, trying to, trying to understand, um, trying to sort of revivify and imagine myself into someone's shoes. Um, I used to teach World Lit, and once I used the, the Norton Anthology, and they had these, these translations of ancient Egyptian love poems. Um, and I was like, oh, this is just like, the same, it's the same stuff. Like, hey girl, I saw you down by the river washing those clothes, you was looking good, can we like get together? Like, we, we, we as, as creatures haven't changed that much, right? And so this is back to this idea of the human condition. Like, what is the human condition that I'm interested in? And so for me, with um, both Dangerous Goods and Bud Ties and Brown Liquor, that condition is thinking about home. The first book is me looking at the home I grew up in, in that community. And then the second book, is thinking about what it means to sort of move away from that and find home somewhere else. Um, my third book is just sort of a continuation of the second book in some ways, like thinking about like what does it mean to now be in Montana, to have gone to Alaska from Minnesota. Um, but it, you know, my life has changed too. I now have a son, so fatherhood is in the third book as well. I'm, it's in that backpack. It's a hairy mess, but um, I'm working on it. Um, it's supposed to, be, I have to, I've been told it's coming out next year, so I gotta finish it. Um, but, but so there's sort of like exploration of the human condition and the things that sort of those themes that, that come up and the ones that important to me are like home and now it's fatherhood. Um, lately, I and so many others are concerned with environmental degradation, those kinds of things. I'm also fascinated by, by race right, the construction of race. Um, so it's, that's sort of this ongoing project from book to book. Um, and there are historical things you can talk about with all of those things. Um, for me, the historical thing here was Liberia to talk about home. And the figure that, that I was most interested in was this Sandy Ganaway because of like, you go to all the trouble to get over there. What, bring, what, what drives you back to Georgia, where you spent most of your life enslaved? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, Professor Hill, that was just terrific. Um, thank, you. thank you. This is a broader question. Um, what is the role of poetry in political activism? Does poetry take a side in political activism, or does it document and shine a light on issues that are terribly important for then the reader to decide his or her own 
values. <laughs> yes, all of the above. Um, the, I, th I think that there, there's so many takes on this question. Um, most everything's political. Um, poetry is cultural work. Um, I think sort of not writing about, like, I, I, I don't ever want to write propaganda, but I do want to explore sticky top topics, right? Um, so I think the role is not, you don't, you don't want to write propaganda. Everything's political. If you choose to write about um, nature in this way that sort of disregards the context you're seeing nature in, that's a political choice. Um, I, I have these, these poems that fall into the eco poetry category. They think, they think about relationships. Um, they think about, they, they're sort of trying to work ecologically, but they also work historically because that's what I'm interested in. Um, and so you know, I write these poems and they don't fit with a nature poem aesthetic. And I've had other pe people ask, like, well, there's oh, that tension. Like, how is it that you fall easily into that tension of not just immersing yourself in nature? Um, and I think I do that some, maybe, but I'm also very much aware when I'm in nature that I'm in a particular body in nature, right? Um, and so that comes out in the work. Does that make sense? I really enjoyed your your uh, Tanager poem very much. Um, Thank you. I'm interested in, you seem to have a pretty good sense of, sometimes I feel like you're almost writing a Villanelle or something in there. Yes, you're very astute, yes. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm interested in who you consider, like in terms of your background as a writer and a reader, who are your influences, who are people that you turn to that you would read uh, in terms of like whether it's from where you grew up as a regional sort of poet or yeah um more broadly i think like broadly i'm i'm trying to read broadly um these days uh and a lot of it is my my sort of contemporaries my peers and just sort of in meeting new people but like the people i i was talking to my grad students about this like you know the people i'm going to the conference and seeing are basically my grad student cohort um who we all didn't have books at one point. And we've been working and reading people and sharing books and saying, read this, read that. Um, and now we're doing this thing. Uh, so we're sort of carrying, carrying on the, um, this, this, this project, our projects. Um, when I was first starting out, like the poets that I, I, I think were most influential to me were um, sort of broadly were Yusef Komenyaka, poets like Yusef Komenyaka and Rita Dove. Um, who were interested in, in writing about um, the African American family in sort of a different way than um, black arts writers were. Um, but also Seamus Heaney was very influential um, and a poet I was introduced to in grad school, um, Constantine Cavafy, who writes a lot about history. And so he sort of showed me a way, cracked things open for me to think about how to write about historical stuff. Um, and it was just like, oh, I can actually, I see these, these people in ancient Greek history that he's writing about because he writes about them so um, humanizingly, so intimately, so specifically with such detail. Um, and in one of the poems he talks about the fact that one of the characters he writes about we, is not a major historical figure. There's not a lot about this figure. And so that allows him to imagine the life more fully as a poet. I was like, oh, these people, these black people I'm writing about are very much not major historical figures. And so I, I can imagine their lives a little better, right? Um, that's, so that's, a, that's a long way from Bemidji, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I came across here, which I found very captivating. Yeah. I don't know how many people have been to Bemidji, but yeah. 
Yeah, and yes, villanelles. That that this poem is, is basically a villanelle, the tanager poem. It's just a, a exploded villanelle. It kind of I needed um, a little more space, so I just blew it out a little bit. But yeah, but I yeah I like the villanelle. I like my like my two sort of villanelle um, poles and you know grandparents are like Elizabeth Bishop's one art and then Dylan Thomas's you know, Do Not Go Gentle. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, those was, there was are the ones that sort of influence the way I think about villanelles. And, it, and then it's become a thing where I've invented forms that are villanelle-esque. I, I, I like refrains, um, yeah. It needs some broadening. Yeah, yeah. I got a question right here. Yes. Uh, what is your perception of a poem when you first read a poem to after you've done your research? It's, Excuse me? So when you first read a poem, um, what is the difference for when you first read a poem from after you do your research further on the person who wrote the poem and the history behind it? Hmm. Um, <laughs> it, I think it just adds layers. It opens things up. Um, I, I feel like poems uh, stand revisiting and they grow with us as we sort of grow and learn new things. Good poems, you know, um, and even the poems that we write change as we change. Like our relationships to the poems change. Um, I had a poem that I wrote that I was, I was like, oh, this is a good poem. Whatever it's in the book, um, and it had language um, that I borrowed from my grandmother, um, and then she died, and I went to the funeral. And I mourned. And then a few months later, I, I go to read that poem in front of an audience, and I just I just started crying. And I was like, "That's new," because I've read this poem for years, <laughs> you know, and never cried. And I just like I'm just I I, I just cry, I cried my way through the poem. Um, and then there was like a like probably a two year period of me slowly coming to the the space where I went from bawling my way through the poem to like choking up. So now I can read the poem and it's okay. You know, but that's 10 years down the line. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, our, our, we're in relationships with poems. Sean, I was really taken with your um, observation about history providing a lens. Yeah. Um, lenses oftentimes uh, magnify. Yeah. They can also distort mm -hmm. conveniently. Yes. And I, I, as it, your observation about history and poetry just kind of blew a little something in my mind yeah. about how history can be the inspiration, but the words, the craftsmanship of writing the poem about the history cannot exactly be historical. Right. But they're still legitimate. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I want to cleave as close to the historical fact as possible, but I'm doing different work than a historian. My wife's a historian. Um, we, we are, she's like, everyone wants to be a historian. Um, and I was like, uh, maybe. Like, I, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing a different thing with, with the poem than she would be with um, an article or a book. Um, and I, 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 I think the poem is just one site of the work, one site of the sort of the cultural work, if you want to call it that. Um, and there's, it doesn't take away from the history, the work that she's doing. I think they can talk to each other. They should both be available. Um, and you know, the scientific poem does not take away from the science. You should go read the science too. The, the poem is just like, it's, it's one way to engage. Um, I think about um, like translation. Um, I have some poems that are translated into Korean. This is interestingly, to me at least, I'm still just like, how did that happen? Um, a translator found my work and she took poems from both books and put them together in one book as a selected translated Korean volume. And I was like a little concerned. I was like, 
it's, I don't know, I can't read it. I don't know if it's good translation. And a friend of mine was like, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect your poems. It just gives you a, your poems a different audience. And if they're good translations or bad translations, if they inspire people's interest, you will have more translators. I've since found that they're good translations. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was like, oh, that, yeah, I shouldn't be proprietary of like, the work that way. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And so like the history, like I'm not rewriting or getting rid of history. I'm like, I'm engaging with history. And I'm hoping that some historians might engage with the poems. Well, um, I hope they will. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? This is fascinating. Um, we have way too few poets come to our lecture series. Yeah. And hopefully we'll change that. Um, Fingers crossed. It, it's, it's just too important of a part of the university for us to not pay more attention to it. Mm. Um, any questions? OK, um, again, please be thinking about um, the lecture series this year. Also, people watching at home. Uh, next week, we're going to want to hear some feedback. Uh, we'll figure out a way to get that about the series, uh, about the th kinds of things that you'd like to hear about things going on at the university that we could feature in our series next year, in further years. Um, this is a community lecture series, which is put on for you by us, but it's, it's got a two-way component. We need to hear back from you on what it is you want to hear about and even specific faculty that you think should be featured. So that's our invitation from the committee to you. So plan on thinking that through this week and giving us some feedback next week. There, one additional note, Jeff. We are, there will not be a lecture next Tuesday. Uh, it's spring break. So we're, we're going to take a little spring break. And then the, the last one will be on the 28th. So you can show up next week, but there will be nothing happening. Don't come here. Come in two weeks. And um, our lecturer is Julia Galloway. She's a ceramic artist. And uh, in the brief conversations that I've had with her, uh, she has a very definite research component in her work. So uh, I'm very excited to have an actual um, physical visual artist uh, to come talk with us about her work and research. So we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.